Our title today, we're continuing with the series, Cultivating Discipleship, Nurturing Spiritual Growth. Our focus scripture, or anchor scripture, if you will, is 1 Timothy 4 and 7. It's important for part B of verse 7. It's important for us to remember that as we go through these series, so we don't lose sight of why we're studying it. The part of that scripture that we're focusing on, Paul tells Timothy, Train yourself to be godly. That's what he said. We're going to review a little bit in a minute. Uh, last week, the week before, and talk about today's message. Following Jesus as a guide would be our title in the topic. Following Jesus as a guide. Consider the last time you delved into the scriptures or participated in a Bible study. What biblical insights did you gain? At the conclusion of every Bible lesson, you should be able to say, this is what I learned from scripture. It struck this chord in my life for me. That's every lesson. Whether you're studying in your private time, whether you're part of an online group, whether you are in a Bible study like here, what was the scripture and what was the message for you? That's what we're studying. It should happen all the time. What biblical insights did you gain and how do you plan to apply them? Remember, the word is for us, not for us to look at other people. I plan to apply what God has shown me in that scripture, or those scriptures to my life. Today's lesson in the Cultivating Discipleship, Nurturing Spiritual Growth series, ponders how to incorporate Jesus' teachings and examples into our everyday lives. That's what it is. How do we do that? It's something we hear all the time. We're going to look at what the scripture says and figure out together how we can do that. Let's review. In our anchor scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7b, Paul urged Timothy to train for godliness. So far, we have explored two biblical aids for helping us train for godliness. Our first lesson in this series reminded us that the Holy Spirit empowers us to resist temptation. Remember that lesson? We focused on the you must resist temptation. That's part of training yourself. The thoughts come into your mind, but you don't have to submit to those thoughts, right? Right, because we have the power. Remember that little song, Yield the Temptation? for yielding is sin. The other thing it, we understood is that the temptation does not mean that we have a desire or are guilty. It just means that there is an outside force trying to entice us to disobey God's word and to disregard God in essence. Forget that God is, that's what temptation is. And we have to fight it and we have been empowered to do so. That was our first lesson in this series. The second session reminded us that exercise for godliness involves training one's mind to embrace and reflect godly principles. That's why we read scripture, we meditate on it, and we memorize it. Not so that we can spout it to other people, but so that it is inside of us and the Spirit can call it, with, call it back up to us when we need it to help us know how to live. That is learning biblical principles and putting them into practice. Let's see. See, I messed up what I was writing. So let me see, I try to read what I have so I don't get too excited. In today's lesson, we ask and answer the question, how do we incorporate Jesus' teachings and examples into our training for godliness? How do we do that? That should always be a question. How do I do that? Not we. And when we speak, it's the reason the preacher says we, because that is to include ourselves in it. But when I study in my personal life, I don't say we, I say allegra. 
What is God saying to you? That's the, what you should be asking. Lord, what message is there for me? Now it has broader application, that is true, but it has to begin with the individual because otherwise we become very preachy and it, what we're doing in some ways is absolving ourselves of responsibility and not wanting God to hold us accountable. You see, it's we, it's what kids do, everybody's doing it. You understand what I'm saying? And so when we study, it is what message did I get? How am I to apply that to my life? If that isn't happening, go back and study. What biblical text or themes would Timothy use and can we use? How about Jesus' declaration that anyone wishing to be one of his disciples must pick up their cross and follow him? Unlike Timothy, we have benefited from thousands of years of theological study and having the scriptures in multiple languages and translations to unpack what Jesus meant. Just think about it. They didn't have those things, but we do. Jesus' explanation of what it means to follow him indicates that his disciples must lead life Marked by compassionate service, pulled by faith and obedience to God and to serve with humility. Marked by compassionate service. We are servants. Jesus was a servant. We call him the servant, decide the servant Messiah. Because Serve means to empower other people. That's what Jesus did. We're going to go through the text and see that today. And that's what he calls us to do. Follow my lead. Follow me. I'm sure at the time some of them said, what does that even mean? Because remember, they hadn't seen the suffering, but he was warning them. Pick up your cross. It's not going to be easy. We're going to talk about why. The following Bible references illustrate how to engage in compassionate service, because that should be the first thing you ask. What does she mean by compassionate service? Where did she get that? Let's look at it. The first reference is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but it's a parable of Good Samaritan. It is one of several New Testament scriptures that illustrate compassion as a characteristic of godliness, not limited to a particular religious tradition. After telling the parable, Jesus asked, which of these three men, remember the parable, there were three men, two of them were religious leaders, saw the man who had been robbed and walked by him. The third one was not a religious leader and was a, um, probably a Jewish saw the man's need and met the man's need. Remember, he picked him up, he took him to what we would call a motel today or a hostel, and he said, take care of him, and if he needs anything, I'm going to leave money and I will bring some back to make sure he's taken care of. And so the question Jesus asked them, which of these three men do you think showed that they, the man was their neighbor? The listener said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. You see it, now practice it. You see, when Jesus told parables, they're not just cute stories for us to remember. They are to make it clear his message, his call for us, what he expects from us. Go and do the same, since you understand the message so well. Now let's look at its application, how Jesus applied it. Jesus met people's material and physical needs. That's what he did. He acknowledged that he was the son of God. He acknowledged that he and God were equal. He did not elevate himself above the people. He met their needs. He didn't create needs so that he could look good or elevate himself. He looked at where people were and met whatever needs they had, their deepest needs. Now, we can't do everything, but there are a lot of things we can do. We'll talk about that in the second part. He healed and gave food to the hungry. 
He fed the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. It says, now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him. Now they were following Jesus, we believe, because if you read scripture in context, because of the miracles, Jesus was the it man of the moment. I don't know, he was the influencer of the time. And some people are like that. They want to be, they follow every friend. This is why the scripture says, don't be double-minded, because somebody else comes along and they follow them too. They're not rooted in anything. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because as we get closer to Easter, we're going to remember on Palm Sunday, they were throwing down their coats saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? But then on Good Friday, what did they say? Crucify him, the same people. Now what they did to Jesus, they will do to us. But the more important thing is that we understand that Jesus at this point was popular. He hadn't yet shown his true self. They hadn't fully understood who he was. And so as long as he was delving out miracles, they were happy, you see. But he did do that. He met their needs. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he was sure, meaning Jesus, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them. That's what should always move us. We should be moved to help people out of compassion. No other reason. We should see their need and do it out of compassion. It's the first step in following Jesus. Remember, the scripture we looked at was the Good Samaritan. He said, go and do that. If that's, what it, that's what it means. You do it. And he healed their sickness. When he was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away. They were the people hard and hungry that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Listen to Jesus' response. But Jesus told them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. You. You do it. Don't call anybody. Don't send them away. You do it. You see, God never gives us something to do that we can't do. And what he was reminding them and us of, there's always a way if a person comes into our presence and we are aware of their needs, we don't have to worry about not having enough. God knows their needs, so if he reveals the need to us, we have the means to meet that need. And that's what Jesus was saying to them. He said, no, they don't need to go away. You meet their needs. They told him, which makes sense, we have only five loaves and two fish here. And he said, bring them here to me. In other words, it becomes much in the master's hand. You have to trust me. You can say, well, I don't have it. Oh, but if you have it in there, you use it to the glory of God and trust God that it will meet the need that he has presented to you. That is for you to show your faith Ordering the people to sit down on the ground, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and breaking the loaves. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up 12 full baskets of leftover broken pieces. About 5,000 men besides women and children ate. That was a lot of people eating that little bit of food. Now, whether you take this literally or you see it metaphorically, the point is that the scripture is teaching us that God can make something out of nothing. And the little bit we have, when we understand it's from God, he will show us how to use it to his glory and to meet people's needs. Later, we're going to talk about what does that mean practically? Because that's what we're talking about. Let's look at some other examples of scripture, though. Jesus interacted with marginalized people. First, Jesus acted with compassion, always with compassion. Secondly, he interacted with marginalized people. 
He could have been with kings and queens and the leaders of the time, but he, did, he chose not to. Look at the disciples he chose from all walks of life. Who were these people? They were lepers and others ostracized from society because of illness, conditions, or circumstances. In Mark chapter 1, verses 44 through 41, recounts Jesus healing lepers. Imagine how they felt. They, he gave them hope. When they saw Jesus, they weren't afraid. They wanted to be healed. Everyone who had a problem, when they came to Jesus, they never expected him to say no. Instead, what they said was whatever they had need of, Jesus, heal me. Sometimes they didn't have to ask, but when they did, they were direct. And there is nowhere in scripture where Jesus didn't meet their need. Mark chapter 5, verse 9, and in Luke chapter 8, verse 30, tell about Jesus interacting with and healing a demon-possessed man. Now imagine this man, in some translations it says, he was so violent that he had to be chained. Some say in a graveyard, others will say close to a graveyard, but we get the point that this man was so violent that they didn't want him in their town, but they didn't want to kill him, who knows why, and so they chained him up like an animal. But when Jesus saw the man, instead of turning his back, Jesus had pity on him and began to engage him in conversation. Think about it, he didn't just heal him first, he talked to the man. I can't even imagine what the man must have felt. This is the first human being who has talked to me like I'm one of them. Imagine how empowering that is. Not that fake smile, not that fake how you doing. Real engagement. And then he healed him, he delivered him. Remember the demons were so upset that they said, may be different in your translation, but the gist of it is they didn't want to leave, but when they knew they had to leave, they said, please let us go into the pigs. Now there's a scripture, I can't quite quote it exactly, but it says something about once you're cleaned up and you let them back in, they come back in twofold. But Jesus had compassion. He spoke to the man. Jesus got no glory from that because the religious leaders, as always, were no doubt upset. Anything that goes against, that is godly, that goes against their power, privilege, and prestige, they don't like. Think about it. Wherever you look in history, not just in scripture, this is what happens. So there's no doubt they were upset. He went in there and did something that we don't like. What is it? He delivered the man. He treated him like he was, he was human, created by God, in God's image. He released him, relieved him of his suffering. You know, they were always mad. Remember when Jesus healed the blind man, they didn't want to believe it. They were so determined to prove that Jesus wasn't who he said he was that they said to the man, how did it happen? And remember, the man got so frustrated, he told them, I don't know how he did it. I just know I was blind, but now I see. The parents had to say, that is our son. Then they wanted to say, well, he was faking all that time because sometimes we're so corrupt when we see something good, we can't even recognize it. Isn't that tragic? Isn't that tragic? But they couldn't make the man lie. John chapter four, verses one through 26. Women's History Month, this might be an appropriate sermon at some point to preach about. But in that passage, it describes Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. The account is significant because it, it is reported that Jesus' followers would have looked down on the woman because she was of mixed race and a different religion. She didn't practice religion like we do. Now in Christendom, and I'm sure it's true in other religions, but I haven't studied them 
well enough to understand this, but I know in Christendom, some of us get stuck on our denominations. And we do not believe that anybody else is in relationship with Christ if they don't belong to our denominations. That's a fact. That's a fact. We don't believe it. But isn't it funny that Jesus said, I have other sheep and they are not of this fold? He said it throughout the scripture. And so here Jesus was interacting with this woman. She was a woman. That was the first thing. And you know, women had a subservient position in society at that time. Our value came from our men. Ladies, aren't you glad you're not living in that time? Because some of us would have been hung. You know, I'm laughing, but I had a student. He was from Ghana. God bless him. And he's called me not too long ago. And the man said to me, we were teaching, and he said, oh, Miss Suits, I want to take you back to Ghana so bad. And he was Muslim. And I said to him, I would end up getting both of us killed because they would say, you done brought this woman over here and she's telling our women that they're free in Jesus, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and she has no fear. I said, I don't think so, young man. I don't think you want to take me back with you. But I said that to say, think about the time in which they lived. Discrimination has always existed. It's not unique to the Western Hemisphere. You can look in every country in the world. If you look in Ireland, you see the Protestants in the um, Protestants, the Catholic and the Protestants fighting, have been for years. We don't hear as much about it anymore, but it used to be horrible, right? If you look in Africa, most people, it's funny, some people think Africa is a country. Africa is a continent with hundreds of countries. There is diversity in there. People are discriminated against there. It may not always be because of skin tone. Sometimes it's because of position. You know what I'm saying is true. This is the world over. There is no place in the world and no place in history where discrimination has not existed. It's what we humans do when we want to amass power. You see, in some cultures, they're not allowed to talk about it. Thank God for America, because at least not yet, we have the freedom to express opposition to what, in a peaceful way, to whatever the government says, right? We can change it. In four years, we can change everything. Just put another person in and hope that they're more honest than the last group, right? But imagine being stuck. There's no hope. One of the things I always thank God for when I think about America is how far we've come in such a short time. You see, despite all of its problems, just think, for those people in my age group, it wasn't too long ago that there were places we could not go. There was, wasn't too long ago when we didn't have the right to sit anywhere on the bus. Young people forget that, you see, because it's a given. But that was not always true for us. And we were told that early on, be careful, be careful. My goodness, I imagine the woman was elated, even though she tried to, I won't say tried to trap him, but she wanted to, I would say she engaged him. What do you mean by that? The things you're saying, you don't know what you're worshiping. We know that this is not, you, she, you, you're asking me for water. Why are you doing that? Interesting. The preceding scriptures illustrate in practical ways how to show the love of God by following Jesus' teachings and examples. We began with a parable and then looked at how Jesus applied that parable. That's what we just did. We looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan, and then we went through scriptures, and those were only two or three in the New Testament because we're looking at following Jesus. And we looked at how did Jesus apply his own teachings? Well, that's what he did. He showed compassion. He served with humility. He never thought he was bigger than anybody else. He met the needs of every person who came to him or who was in his presence. There is a an account in the scripture of a man, a ruler, who was not of the Jews, and his child, I don't remember his daughter, his son had died. My brother Marky was here, he would call it out right away, who 
son was sick. And the man had come to Jesus and they said, the disciples said, you know, he's not of us, but he's a godly man. We must remember that God has people that don't look like us, that don't talk like us. That does not mean they're not godly. Now, we may not be able to fellowship with them because of tradition. Sometimes that happens. But that does not mean those people are not godly and it's not our place to judge them. From biblical examples to personal application, and I'm nearly through. What did the Good Samaritan do that I can do as well? That's the question. You see, when we read that, we shouldn't just be able to say, well, the Good Samaritan, what did he do that I can do? He saw a need, and he did not allow that man's condition. I imagine from the way the scripture described him, he was bloodied and beat up. Some of them might have thought he was drunk, but he did not allow what he saw to stop him from meeting the man's needs. It reminds me of the song we love to sing. Dottie Rambo used to sing it beautifully. Andre Crouch, I think, was the, I'm not sure which of them wrote it. He looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. That's what we're called to do. Look beyond people's faults and see their needs. We're not expected to meet every need. We're expected to meet the needs that God has empowered us with the resources to do. And so if someone's in need of food, that's our responsibility. Not to, I mean, there are times when we work as a congregation to do things, but more importantly, it is when God shows me the need, it is my responsibility then to do whatever God has called me to do to help meet that need. That's what it is. Without being bitter, the scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. Isn't that what he says? It won't always be money. But you know what I find funny, though? People who like to say they give don't like to give their money to meet people's needs. I'm just being honest. They don't like to. They will coordinate all kinds of stuff. But when it comes time to giving money, they don't usually give it. The people who give the most usually don't say anything about it. They just do it. Nobody ever even knows there was a need. They just give it. That's what God calls us to do. A person needs their rent paid. You are the one who knows about it. You pay it. You see? Now, I'm not a preacher who stands up and tells you to give God, give me your money. I told you, you pay your bills first because Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and render unto God that which is God. So you pay your bills first. Once you've paid your bills, when you see a need, you meet the need, whatever it is. It's not always money. As my brother Mark would remind me, it's not always, is it always money? No, but it requires sacrifice. Then you get up, you give them a ride. You commit to taking them back and forth until they're able to stand on their own. You know that they need somebody to help them carry their groceries. You carry their groceries. You know they need someone to mow the lawn or shovel snow. Whether you do it yourself or pay someone to do it, that is your opportunity to give. So everybody doesn't have money to give, but everybody has time. You listen while they talk. Maybe you don't agree with it, but it's not your role to agree. It's not your place to give them advice. Some of us are quick to give advice, and I find that most people who give advice, nobody listens to them because they sound dumb, because they can only look from one perspective. Just listen. Maybe the advice is, I don't have the answer, but I will pray with you and for you. Don't give it. You're not a doctor. Don't tell people how to get rid of their aches and pains. You can say, you know what? I tried this and it worked. Who are the people on the margins? These are questions for us. Who are the people on the margins that I encounter? Who are they? Think for a minute. Who are these people that we encounter? Where do we see them? Many of us look on the outside, but sometimes they're right in our family. Sometimes they're in our own family. 
people who are old who can't help themselves. But you see, they're of no benefit to us because helping them, nobody sees it. Or maybe they're people who've made poor life decisions, have money, they, you know, whatever it is. And we've decided, nope, we'll give out, we'll see a person on the street, we'll give them, but we will not give to the person in our family because there's no glory in that. There's a scripture that says not helping your family, you're worse than an infidel when you know they have a need. Someone asked me, well, pastor, what if my family member is an addict? Well, you got to pray for them. You don't owe them money, but you do not neglect their children because the children have nothing to do with their parents. And so the whole notion of, well, we're not going to help the children because we help the children, we're helping the parents. That's ridiculous. So you're going to allow the child to suffer when you know the child has a need, a need for clothing or food or decent shelter. When you go on vacation, why don't you invite those children to go with you? Because you know their parents can't take them. And when you take them, don't treat them as though they're different than the rest of the family. You make them feel welcome. You treat them with compassion. In what way? Can I serve them with compassion? The Holy Spirit will tell you. The Holy Spirit will lead you. I can, all, I can tell you with few exceptions, you will not get any glory if it's from God. No glory. If it's from God, nobody knows. It'll be just you and them. Their needs will have been met, and in many cases, they don't even have to know that the need, is come, that the need being met is coming from you. You see, doing your alms in secret, Jesus said, don't do that for men to be seen of men. If you do, you've already, you already have your reward. You see. In conclusion, let us embrace Jesus' call to follow him as an active call to show compassion while serving with humility to the glory of God. Furthermore, that Jesus' life was a testament to his love. He met people's deepest needs, and by God's grace and the power of his Holy Spirit, we can too. Moreover, like Jesus' example, when we serve humbly with compassion, people have hope. Even if it is just a glimmer, that glimmer of hope allows them to recognize the truth. God is with them and cares about them. They matter to God, and so do we. To God, glory. My brothers and sisters, we are about, I will give the call to inv the invitation to discipleship before we have communion, the communion hymn. For those of you who do not know him in the pardon of your sins and in the power of his resurrection might, I, I encourage you to come to Jesus. Remember, Jesus loves you. He cares about you. He died for you. You're never too bad for God. And there is never a reason if you have been born again and are in the family of God not to take communion. What you do is before you partake of the elements, you spend a moment, you meditate on the scripture, you meditate on your life and reflect because it is for believers, and if we listen carefully to the invitation, this one especially, it reminds us that Jesus fed his friends and his enemy. And so just take a moment to reflect upon where you are with Jesus. And then if you have been born again, there's no reason not to take communion. You should listen to last Thursday's message from the um, Westminster Catechism, because that's what it talks about. It's not we that make ourselves worthy. None of us are worthy. It is the blood of Jesus and his great kindness to us.